Namaste and greetings. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anisandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend a warm welcome to you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a special talk on India and the evolving global order delivered by Professor Harsh V. Pant. This discussion is being organized by the IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies. I feel privileged to introduce the chair for the session, Dr. Rafiq Dosani. Sir is the director of the RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy, a senior economist at the RAND Corporation, and a professor at the Pardi RAND Graduate School. He works on education, finance, regional development, security, trade, and technology issues. His recent projects include Security in the Korean Peninsula, the Belt and Road Initiative, Track to Diplomacy between the United States and China, and Asia's Democratization. Previously, Sir was the director of Stanford University's Center for South Asia and a senior research scholar at Stanford University's Institute for International Studies. He holds a PhD in finance for Northwestern University, an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, and a BA in economics from Stain Stephens College, Delhi. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. With the permission of the chair, I'd like to introduce the speaker and discuss him for today. Sir? Please. Thank you. I am honored to introduce the eminent speaker, Professor Harsh V. Pant. Sir is the Director of Studies and Head of Strategic Studies Program at Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi. He holds a joint appointment with the Department of Defense Studies and King's India Institute as Professor of International Relations at King's College, London. He is also a non-resident fellow with the Wadwani Chair in US-India Policy Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Washington, DC. Professor Pant has been a visiting professor at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, a visiting fellow at the Center for, for the Advanced Study of India, University of Pennsylvania, a visiting scholar at the Center for International Peace and Security Studies, McGill University, and an Emerging Leaders Fellow at the Austria India Institute, University of Melbourne. Professor Pan's current research is focused on Asian security issues. His recent books include New Directions in India's Foreign Policy, Theory and Praxis, India's Nuclear Policy, The US Pivot and Indian Foreign Policy, Handbook of Indian Defense Policy, India's Afghan Model, and the US-India Nuclear Pact, Policy, Progress, and Great Power Politics. Professor Pant writes regularly for various Indian and international media outlets, including the Japan Times, the Wall Street Journal, the National, the Hindustan Times, and the Telegraph. We welcome you, sir. We are fortunate to have with us Dr. Parama Sinhapat Pale as the discussant for the session. Ma'am is an adjunct senior fellow at the Raja Ratnam School of International Studies in the Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. She is the author of Analyzing China's Soft Power Strategy and Comparable Indian Initiatives. Her current research focuses on new in media and foreign policy of India and other major powers. Welcome, ma'am. The deliberation is being moderated by Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI. Now, I invite Dr. Mehta to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. A very good evening to everyone from India. Thank you, Mahima, for leading us into the discussion today. It is an honor for me to be moderating this session in the presence of distinguished scholars of international relations. I welcome you all. The global order is in the state of constant flux. And India is not a silent spectator, but rather it is an active participant in the state of affairs around the world. In light of the several developments occurring on the international scene, 
especially in its immediate and extended neighborhood, the most prominent being the actions and reactions of belligerent state and non-state actors raises concerns and also opportunities. Competition among the major powers have resurfaced and this is only getting intensified each passing day. Do these changes offer India the scope and prospects to participate in crafting of political and economic institutions? And to not forget, India is currently at the Un United Nations Security Council by virtue of it being uh, the non-permanent member. The topic, India and the evolving global order, hence becomes very important. And I'm confident that the discussion today would pave the way for an informed understanding of prevailing and impending patterns of geopolitics and India's role in it. So without taking any further time, I invite the chair of the session, Dr. Rafiq Dusani, to make his opening remarks and thereafter invite Professor Harsh Pant for his lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Simi, and thank you for that generous introduction, Mahima. Uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I thought as part of my opening remarks, I would uh, list some questions that perhaps our main speaker could uh, use as preparatory material uh, to help him think through his presentation. Of course, he's already thought through his presentation, but it's more uh, in terms of some issues that I thought might be worth raising. So if I might request, I have three slides. If we put that up. Yeah, the next slide, please. Yeah. Next, please. So the first question I raise is, does India have strategic autonomy or are its actions largely reactive? You know, in a world order, um, there are big players like the United States, which clearly have a great deal of strategic autonomy. And then there are smaller players, not necessarily smaller players in terms of population, but just in terms of, of their place in the world. Indonesia comes to example as a big country that's largely has very little strategic autonomy in what, what it does. So, you know, I'd use an analogy of stock markets. Is India a market maker? Does it help create the market or is it just a price taker? One more player. So that I think is an important question. The second is how important is collaboration with big powers for strategic autonomy? So it may be that even though a country has strategic autonomy, it still likes to collaborate for a variety of reasons. It could be location-based. It could be because the other country brings something unique to the table in terms of economic, diplomatic, social, or military resources that the first country doesn't have. So the question then is, what does India uniquely bring to the table? So this is the first set of questions. Next slide, please. I'm cleverly not answering any of them because that's, I don't know. Uh, then we come to the, you know, the two main uh, great powers of today. One is really a great power, the United States and China is an aspiring great power. So China and India uh, just give a sense of material power differentials. If you look at the two decades that of this century, it, that's the period that witnessed China's transformation to a global power. Today, its savings rate at 45% is over three times that of the US, which is below 15%. Now its GDP is 66% of the US. So if you just do the math, you see that it generates savings, which can then be used to create new infrastructure, the BRI, the People's Liberation Army. The total amount every year that uh, they have to spend is twice that of the US. So anyone who makes comparisons on just per capita GDP should consider this as well. By contrast for India, India's savings rate is 28%, which is again, twice that of the US. As GDP is 13%, so if you just figure it out, it's total new investable capital is about 25% of the US, compared, by, compared to twice that of the US for China. Now, even though India therefore cannot strictly be compared to China, that amount is still significant. It's about half of Japan. We should ask, does India deploy its investable capital well to build e India's economic, military, and diplomatic power? So that's the second set of questions. And then finally, next slide, please. 
looking at the US, you know, what we know is that from 2014 onwards, so the, towards the end of the Obama administration, there was a change in US assessments of China as a weakly led internally focused country to a country with strong leadership and with regional and global ambitions. As a result, the US is focused on containing China's rise. The question for India is how ready is it to accommodate this change? For example, if it could affect the future of multilateral institutions to which India is deeply committed, like the UN, WHO and WTO, what does this mean? What are the alternatives? Second, India has several bilateral issues, but that can only be dealt with with China, border disputes, sea lanes in the Indian Ocean, trade issues, cybersecurity, etc. So how will these be affected by, uh, by the US and India coming closer together. So with these questions, then I will uh, conclude my presentation and request uh, Professor Pant to begin his. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Rafiq, uh, for I think uh, pointing out uh, some of the internal questions uh, for, for those who study Indian foreign policy. Then. I think they, they, they frame some of the points that I'm going to make uh, very nicely. Uh, so thank you for raising them at the very beginning. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, Arjun Sanu for inviting me to this conversation. And, uh, it's, it's always uh, interesting to talk about India's role, uh, particularly at a time right now when the global order is evolving at such a rapid pace that, that it's almost dizzying to catch up. You know, it's, uh, just look at what has happened in Afghanistan. Uh, and, uh, 20 years of policy dissolving in a matter of hours. Uh, so clearly, uh, there are issues on various fronts that uh, India has to tackle, and I think that the international order has to absorb, uh, which I think both of them together will be, uh, it's, it's, uh, foreign policy is not a one-way street foreign policy of any nation is a response uh, to what is happening in the global order. And at the same time, uh, in some fundamental ways, uh, uh, global order also responds to a country's rise uh, and adapts uh, accordingly in some ways. So accommodating India into the global order is also uh, an argument for the global order as to what this is, is this is the extent global order uh, flexible enough uh, to uh, to absorb India's aspirations, much like I think to a certain extent Chinese aspirations were absorbed um, three three decades back. So I think those are the you know uh, in some ways uh, one can think about uh, conceptually, but uh, and a number of points that Kapil has pointed out, uh, I'll be uh, pushing them further. Uh, so I, I'll just divide the discussion into sort of two uh, sets of. Uh, uh, ideas, one set of ideas revolve around or one set of discussion revolves around uh, what is happening to the global order and what, what sort of how do you, how can we make sense of some of the challenges, some of the issues that are out, not the challenges, but some of the, the way the configuration is emerging. Uh, so, so what is the emerging global order? How can we assess it? What are the, some of the trend lines? What do we make of, this, of those trend lines? And I think the second set of issues concern uh, India, uh, that what is uh, India doing? How is India responding? And what will be the consequences of that for India to, to, to an extent that we can make uh, some sound guesses at this point. Now, finally concluding with, I think, some of the questions that Rafiq was raising in terms of capacity, in terms of uh, strategic autonomy, strategic thinking, uh, in terms of partnerships, in terms of uh, the contradictions and incoherences at times uh, that are, uh, you know, that a uh, country like India has to face because uh, the choices are not um, stark, the choices uh, at times uh, are more uh, in the gray area. So what do you do? Uh, and, and is that something that we can live with for the foreseeable future? So uh, so if you, if, you, if we go to the first set of questions, first set of issues, which is about the global order, uh, how do we think about it? One way of thinking about it uh, from, a, from an international relations perspective is to just look at uh, you know, three sets of issues. Three sets of issues on the agenda. One is, of course, uh, that the biggest uh, uh, aspect, uh, 
the most fundamental aspect of international relations is, uh, is the structural shift. The rise and fall of great powers, as we understand it, uh, has been the staple of international relations literature. And uh, for a country, for any country, uh, this is the most fundamental challenge that when you have relative stability, you can adapt policies uh, with a certain degree of long-term trajectory. But when there is a flux in the system, then the, the major powers are themselves uh, rising, falling, uh, uh, coming to terms with each other. I think those questions become, uh, you know, there, there has to be an inherent flexibility uh, for, a, for a nation to respond to those challenges. And I think, uh, therefore, the structural challenge in that sense uh, is very, very important to ascertain. So I would just say that, look, uh, when, when we look at the, the structural realities today, uh, when you, what is the most important aspect, which is the, the most important aspect is some kind of power transition happening in the international order. Uh, we don't, I, I don't think anyone knows the destination of this power transition, but I think there is this, one can sense that America of today is not the US of the 1990s. In the 1990s, the idea, uh, early 1990s, the idea was of a unipolar moment. And I think many scholars did term it a unipolar moment precisely because uh, the kind of hegemony that the US had in the early 1990s, that by very definition is unsustainable. Uh, you know, comprehensively global power in every uh, strand, military, diplomatic, economic, political, and I think, uh, you know, just, just after the demise of the Soviet Union. And if you look at the world today, uh, there is much, there's greater degree of complexity just in terms of thinking about, uh, you know, uh, what, what, you know, what kind of a power structure we are looking at. There's a big debate whether it is a, whether we are moving towards a bipolar world or whether there is a still multipolarity in the system where you have European Union, Japan, Russia, also, again, uh, showing of its muscle, uh, India to a certain extent, also contending amongst themselves for this multipolar status. Of course, uh, US and China being the two most dominant players in the, in the game. So, uh, you know, this, this dynamic of what this international order looks like or, or seems like, uh, bipolar or multipolar or, or, you know, or whichever polar um, uh, polarity you may want to use, I think those questions impinge on what a country like India, for example, uh, how a country like India will have to think about its options. So in that sense, this is a big structural shift happening that you, know, you have on the one hand, China, which, which is asserting itself, China under Xi Jinping, perhaps realizing that its time has come and it needs to, it, it no longer needs to uh, hide and bide its time uh, is you know, something that uh, uh, Chinese past leader, leadership was trying to do. Today, under Xi Jinping, it's much more blasé about its role in global politics. It's much more open and explicit about its ambitions. And it's much more aggressive in pursuing those ambitions. So there is a sense that China has arrived and that China wants its due under the international law. And this has always happened. China is not doing something which is, which is out of character. Uh, I think what was interesting was the debate on China before, which talked about that somehow China is going to be a different kind of a great power. I think more and more the consensus is that China is a similar kind of a major power. It is rising in a similar manner. It is asserting itself in a similar manner. Uh, of course, there are issues uh, so far as China's political structure is concerned and the lack of transparency it generates. And, and the questions of intentionality about China's role in global politics. But I think by and large, what we are looking at is a, is a, is a power transition with China's rise, with China's ambitions on the table and uh, America's relative decline, not an absolute one, but relative. Uh, and uh, also, I think um, if you combine this with the changing domestic politics in America, which, which talks about, uh, um, uh, you know, which, which is more about uh, inward orientation. That that also, you know, that, that there is a greater inward orientation in American foreign policy today than we have seen, for example, at any particular point in time since the end of the Second World War. That uh, leads you to certain kinds of conclusions about America's future role. 
and this has been happening for the last several years you know across republican across democratic administrations it started sometime around the obama administration when we when the talk was of focusing more uh, inwards focusing more on american priorities uh, it, uh, it led a, it in some, some would argue it led to the trump phenomena in, in american politics where trump was appealing to um, or appealed to at one particular point in time to the rust belt in america which saw itself losing uh, out uh, to the wider world uh, in, in some other countries uh, and i think that inward orientation has resulted in things like america first etc et so there is a larger reality around america that is changing while uh, you know america will continue to engage with the world the questions are being asked and if you look at the urban withdrawal uh, there is a sense that it, it also reflects at some point that reality that whatever the costs in terms of global uh, image uh, america is Biden is willing to take that call, and Biden is willing to say that, look, I own this, and I'm not afraid of it, and I will, and I, and I'm taking this decision, uh, thinking through the implications of what is happening. So I think there is a there is a larger reality around America that that is also part of this power transition dynamic, where there are concerns about uh, America's future global role, depending on what happens domestic uh, domestically in the U.S. So I think you know the, this power transition is the is the one. One big reality, and when that when this kind of a power transition happens, uh, international uh, you know the, the challenge today to the extant international order is very obvious. If China is rising, uh, if other powers are rising, they would want the international order to reflect their priorities, their interests, uh, as much as it reflected the, the, the interests of the powers that were that have been there in the system. So I think. Uh, that in some ways is a, is, is, is a structural reality that one is having to contend with, not only India, but almost every other country in the world. Related to this is, I think, another structural change, which is um, uh, with emergence of new geographies. For example, uh, you know, a decade back, uh, Indo-Pacific was not part of our academic or policy jargon. But today, no discussion on global politics uh, can be over without one talking about the uh, you know, so, so, so there is a sense in which new geographies are being created and, uh, and uh, geographies are also, uh, uh, like Benedict Anderson said about nations, imagined communities, uh, geographies are also imagined, they are reimagined, they are reconstructed and deconstructed, remolded, molded and remolded. So they, they emerge at different points in time with different lenses. The strategic lens at the moment of the Pacific has given rise to this idea of what uh, Shinzo Abe, the Japanese Prime Minister at one point said, confluence of the two seas, that Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean are not two distinct entities. One has to look at them as one contiguous maritime zone. Uh, and I think that logic is now gradually being accepted by most, most uh, countries in the world. From the West, where you have America, of course, but also countries like Netherlands, Japan, uh, France, UK, European Union, all having their Indo-Pacific uh, outlooks and approaches and policies, to countries like Australia, Japan, ASEAN, uh, India, of course, talking about Indo-Pacific uh, you know, in outlook. There are, of course, certain countries. You have China, for example, uh, that believes that Indo-Pacific narrative is about containing China. But ironically, it is the rise of China that has given, uh, that has made the idea of Indo-Pacific possible. Uh, if China had not risen the way it rose, Indo-Pacific would not have been Indo-Pacific. There, there would have been no need to create this, uh, this new geography. But I think China's rise and response of other players like India, like Japan, to that rise is, is, is what has led to uh, you know, what, is, uh, what, what is now being talked about as the Indo-Pacific uh, construct. So I think in that sense, the idea of Indo-Pacific is again a structural reality. Eurasia on the other hand, on the other side, when you're looking at uh, you know, the role of Russia being reimagined in some ways in the larger Eurasian landscape. Uh, you, Eurasia has been with us for a very long time. But the potency that it is acquired now with Russia becoming flexing its muscles uh, gives you a different flavor of the of the evolving global geopolitical realities. And again, countries li like India and other countries will have are having to contend with that. Finally, on the structural question, I would uh, uh, just raise one final, uh, which I believe is a structural uh, change, 
And that is the way uh, we look at, uh, we think about, or we res are responding to the issues of economic globalization. Uh, you know, the, the, the paradigm at the end of 1990s, that paradigm which was framed in some ways by this Fukuyama-esque logic that from now on, you know, free market capitalism and liberal democracy will spread across the world, you know, the end of history and the last man. Uh, when Francis Fukuyama talks about this in the early 1990s, uh, he saw the demise of the Soviet Union and the victory of the US, or the West, uh, as, 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 as a guarantee, guarantor for liberal uh, values of free market capitalism and liberal democracy. Now, uh, today, if you look at the world, you see a challenge being uh, coming to these fundamental, both of these uh, value systems. But when I'm talking of it, here I'm talking of globalization in particular, because economic globalization is, is under, undergoing a transformation where those who at one point were its biggest champions, um, like the US, uh, like uh, you know, Britain, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, and other European countries, they are taking a step back and re recalibrating their response to what, what they think is acceptable, politically acceptable, you know, economically sustainable aspects of globalization. So globalization is going through a different a unique phase in the in today, which which I think one has to reckon with. I mean, India has been a big, a big beneficiary of globalization, and Indian policymakers still talk of globalization as something that that has benefited India and how they how will they how they respond to that and how they are, how they articulate their issues with globalization. But I think two things have happened. One is that there is a sense in major democracies, in particular, that uh, the the you know the, the changes in uh, in the structure of their economies and in the structure of their uh, wealth distribution has generated a politics which is against uh, uh, certain aspects of globalization. So whether it is American Rust Belt, whether it is uh, you know, British, in fact, uh, the whole logic of Brexit was framed in some ways around this idea of how globalization is, uh, is leading to uh, is, is, is leading to certain kind of a detriment in the, uh, in, in, the, you know, in the quality of life of, of ordinary Britons. So we are moving from a phase where a globalization was seen uh, as, a, as, a, you know, as a good, unqualified good to one where uh, gradually countries are tweaking it to suit their political domestic interests. So whether it is, uh, you know, make in India, in India, whether it is America first in America, we are looking at a, a different sort of narrative being framed around it. So on the one hand, you have this argument about uh, distribution uh, and uh, within within societies and how that is constraining the options of policymakers. On the other hand, you have this argument about uh, about China, that how China has benefited disproportionately because of the forces of globalization and because of the way that China was not forced to acknowledge certain aspects of globalization and not being reciprocal in its response to other, other nations. So I think that has that is again that has led to this uh, remapping re of, of ambitions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China, vis-a-vis -vis economic order, and finally I think on uh, on this point we are looking at a unique uh, aspect of globalization where economic relationships, trade, investment are increasingly being looked at through a strategic prism. That you know you cannot really devoid national security. And, for, uh, and economic ideas. And at one point, the idea was that if you trade more, there is you have better political relationship. Today, I think the countries by and large are saying we want to trade more with those countries with whom we have better political relations. So in a sense, the logic of uh, economic globalization, the logic of um, the, the economic engagement, uh, bilateral and, and multilateral is turning on its head. And that is a reality that also uh, countries are figuring out and we have to respond to. So I, I basically put all these in the structural category, that these are structural changes that are happening. Uh, and, uh, and countries like India have to respond to, to these challenges almost in real time. Following from these structural changes are actually in the global order institutional changes, uh, which are the, 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 if you have a changing in the power structure in, in, in the international system, it is very natural that institutional institutions that were created at a certain point in time to respond to a certain kind of a power structure would be found wanting. So if you have the whole Bretton Woods system that was created in post-1945 global order, you would find that, that 
that system is not really responding to some of the most critical issues of our times. And that is why you see a certain dissatisfaction with institutions. That is why you see uh, from, I mean, this COVID actually exposed, COVID-19 exposed uh, one of the institutions that perhaps uh, very few people knew about, very few people talked about, like World Health Organization. Uh, but today, if you see the debate on World Health Organization, the politicization of World Health Organization, it brought the whole debate about what these organizations are for, how they are being tampered with, how they are being manipulated, and what is the what are the costs of that in some ways. So, so the division is starker. Institutions were always used by major powers. It, it's not today that somehow suddenly uh, it's it's been used in a different in a different manner. But because now you have China, which is uh, doing it because you have a country like China, which has, which has a very different set of an agenda um, about global politics, about global governance, and global order. You see the backlash is equally strong against the institutional framework. So whether you are looking at institutions like UN Security Council and WHO and WTO, which have been found wanting in recent years, or you are looking at regional organizations like uh, for, you know ASEAN, for example. At one point, it was seen as an exemplar of, of uh, uh, regional organizations. So how fantastic ASEAN, you know, uh, books have been written about ASEAN, uh, that ASEAN model is the way to go if you want to regional, regional integration. Today, ASEAN is, is faltering at every step. They don't have an answer to what some of the most fundamental challenges are, they are facing, whether it is Myanmar question, whether it is a question of how do you respond to Chinese aggression, uh, whether you want, you know, how, how do you balance US and China, which was at the heart of ASEAN in 1967 when it was created. So I think ASEAN is struggling to respond to these challenges as, as an institution. Similarly, you have European Union, which you know, which which is struggling. Uh, Britain is out. Uh, you know, if you go back to the debate on COVID and COVID management, there was, there was a big debate about how certain countries were dissatisfied with the way uh, key members of the European Union uh, were uh, managing COVID crisis. Uh, and I, and the, the larger questions which Britain's exit had raised. And which, for the moment, European Union has managed to, um, you know, put, uh, you know, put a blanket on, are still there simmering under the surface. There is a lot of uh, anger and anxiety about the Brussels bureaucracy, the, the idea of a de democratic deficit, uh, and and therefore uh, the ability of European Union to respond to some of the global challenges is in, uh, is also in doubt. So, so we are looking at, uh, and remember, these are some of the institutions that have always been called some of the exemplars. Uh, European Union and ASEAN were the exemplars. Forget SARC. SARC was never, you know, SARC was never working in any case. So, uh, so again, you, you can you can now see how defunct SARC is uh, and how we have moved to a different, uh, you know, uh, to a different understanding in the neighborhood. Uh, but even uh, you know, even those institutions uh, that were seen as working are today struggling. And so there is a larger institutional problem. And and so, and so if you think about the Indo-Pacific, for example. ASEAN was never meant to respond or never meant to be operational in a context where Indo-Pacific geography would emerge. ASEAN was, a, a, was an organization of Southeast Asian countries that were responding to what was happening in their vicinity. Now, today, if you have the Indo-Pacific, which is now the meta, meta geography around them, uh, ASEAN's uh, role becomes marginal in, the, in that sense. And to expect ASEAN to respond to that meta geography is also uh, uh, you know, unhelpful. So in that, in, in that context, the institutional changes, institutional void that we face is equally significant, and one has to be cognizant of that. Third, I think, and, and a related aspect is, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, whether you know, it is fundamental, you know, a question also of, uh, when you have powers that rise, uh, they put pressure on existing institutions, they also put pressure on existing norms. So when you have a normative challenge at the heart of it, for example, the maritime issue, uh, maritime norms, you know, countries took it for granted that freedom of the sea, freedom of navigation, law of the sea, these are, these are some things that, that uh, nations thought in, in, in an age of economic globalization, uh, who, would, who would contest these norms? But today you have countries that are contesting these norms. And so uh, those, those norms that were the, the bedrock of the order that was created, those norms are being contested. The norms have always been contested. But because the power contestation is high, the contestation around norms is becoming sharper. Similarly, you have a whole host of um, issues on which contestation is, is, is emerging or about to emerge, whether it is cyber, whether it is uh, space, whether it is uh, nuclear, whether it is uh, emerging technologies. I think the, you know, 
the critical question for the future of balance of power in the world would be who dominates emerging strategic technologies. And those emerging strategic technologies, be it artificial intelligence, internet of things, um, uh, nanotech, all of these technologies, they are going to determine the structure of economies and the structure of politics. So there is, there is going to be a strong contestation, a large part of Sino-US contestation today is about uh, the domination of these technologies. And so the, how do you, what kind of norms you develop, what kind of regimes you develop for managing these uh, technologies and managing uh, the, the existing norms, that's a, that's a global order issue, that's a global governance issue. And I don't think uh, uh, you know, we, are, we are yet at a point where we see light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe these are early days, but the, the, you know, the, 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 speed, the, the scale and scope of change is so fast that one has to acknowledge that these trends uh, are going to put enormous pressure on countries. Now, now I, you know, what does this mean for India? Now, what is interesting is, is uh, in some fundamental way, India today is, is at the heart of most of these conversations. Whether it is a conversation on, on power transition, whether it is a conversation on emerging technologies, whether it's a conversation on institutional change. Now, this is, I think, also uh, interesting because perhaps this is happening uh, in the past when, uh, when uh, global orders were created. India was not at the center of these conversations. Today, India is a, a, an important element of these conversations. If you know, China is a neighboring country, never before has a major power risen in India's vicinity like China is rising in India's vicinity. So therefore, the challenge on the pressure on India is, is high, perhaps higher than many other countries. So, the, so uh, you know, India is inevitably part of the conversation of power transition. Where does it India go? How does it, whom, with whom does it build its partnerships? So the Sino-Indian contestation is also in some ways at the heart of the contestation in the Indo-Pacific. So, so if you look at the, if you look at why Indo-Pacific came into being, if India would have said no, it would not. There was there was no possibility of, uh, in, of, of, in, of the idea of India Pacific becoming important. So, in some ways, India is at the heart of even uh, creating this new geography. But just as China is at the heart of creating this push towards it, India is at the heart of making sure that others buy into this narrative. So, whether it is uh, you know the Quad is Quad because India is participating in it. Uh, Indo-Pacific is Indo-Pacific because India is part of that larger uh, remapping that is happening in, in India's neighborhood. And, and similarly, institutionally and normatively, India wants today to be part of major regimes and major uh, endeavors to create new institutions. Now, this is again a difference from uh, the past. When, If you go back to the nuclear non-proliferation regime, India wanted to be away from that. India did not want to participate in that. India said this is this is something that I don't want to be a part of because this is, again, discriminatory, it creates two-tier structures, uh, and so on and so forth. But today, India is saying we want to be part of almost all these conversations, whether they are in global governance, climate change, uh, uh, emerging technologies, we want to be part of these conversations. So, so in that sense, they, the, uh, India being uh, you know, at the heart of these conversations means that India has to decide in some way, uh, shape or form, the, the which way it is going to drift, which way it is going to move. And I think uh, in that sense, some of the questions that uh, Rafiq had raised at the very beginning uh, become very important because then it becomes a question of how do you, do you, what do you want? Do you want a strategic autonomy? If you want a strategic autonomy, how do you get it? Do you get it by partnering with countries? If you, if you want to partner with countries, which countries should you partner with? Uh, I think all those questions become uh, more and more real and more and more serious because the rapidity of change imposes certain costs on indecisiveness, on not making those decisions. So, what is so very briefly? What has been India's response in, in, in a few uh, on these issues? One, I think the the major change that you see is is uh, at the level of ideas, and I think this is uh, something that I want to uh, emphasize. That at the at the ideational level, you see India making a transition. Uh, where you have, on the one hand, Indian policymakers are articulating, arguing openly that India wants to be a leading player in the international system. India wants to be a rule shaper, not a rule taker. We want to be part of institutions, regimes where rules are made. We don't want to enter into the room once rules have been made. And I think that's a very interesting shift 
in the way India has India is articulating its response. This is and this means in practical terms that India has to move away from non-alignment uh, uh, kind of an uh, discourse because that inevitably leads you to forces you into making choices. So India's articulation has been that we are no longer non-aligned, but we are willing to align on the basis of issues, so issue-based coalitions. We are willing to engage with, uh, with countries uh, on issues. So we are willing to be part of Quad. We are willing to engage trilaterally with uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific. We are willing to engage with even uh, you know, the West, uh, with, with whom India has had a very difficult bilateral engagement. And finally, um, uh, India is willing to engage with uh, uh, even countries like Russia and China on matters uh, which are important for the, for the specific issue. So we have seen, for example, the Russia, India, China trilateral is still, still there. We have seen the BRICS, for example, Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, South Africa, uh, that platform exists. And this next month, uh, India will be hosting BRICS summit. Uh, so the idea that you should not have partnerships, we have moved to a position where partnerships are seen uh, as helping you into achieving uh, outcomes. So that is, you know, at, at one level, that that ideational push has been very, very interesting. And the other way this push has been interesting is that something which, uh, which is very uh, you know, interesting that uh, you know, at, uh, I'm at, at the moment with Observer Research Foundation, where we conducted a survey of Indian urban youth. Uh, and we just released a report yesterday, uh, sorry, on, on 15th of August. And it is very interesting because the numbers and the urban youth today has no recollection of non-alignment. They have no idea of what, what it means. They have ideas on you know, UN and WTO. They know that what it means. They know SAR. But they have no clue what non-aligned movement means. And they are categorical in another question. They are saying that if China continues to put pressure on India, India should have no inhibitions in joining America. So what I'm telling you is that there are, there are two, le you know, two level changes are happening. One. At the elite level, the perception is shifting in terms of how India is articulating its role on the global stage. At the societal level, India is a very young demographic. Let's also remember the fact that, that youth in this country matter because it's a young demography. India is one of the youngest countries in the world. And so and if you if you have bottom-up approach to these questions, which is, which is very striking, if you look at the numbers, they're quite striking. <clears throat> you are looking at a societal shift as well. So I think this is... Uh, something that perhaps is often missed in, in several accounts of India. But you are seeing an India that is more confident about its ability to manage these, these challenges and contradictions. In the past, the issue was, oh my God, what will we do if we side with Americans? Chinese will come, come to us and they will put pressure on us and so on and so forth. And all uh, governments have responded very, very uh, differently to this, to this dilemma. But one fundamental argument has always been that let's not uh, rock the boat with the Chinese too much. Now, of course, Chinese are sitting on the border. Now, of course, there is a there is a you know new appreciation of the Chinese problem, but also something fundamental changing in the way I think India uh, Indians are approaching this question of alignment and partnerships. I don't I don't see that hesitation that used to be in the previous generation and partnerships. Now, again, there is there may be lack of clarity on what might that might entail. Uh, it may lead to questions about how. To what extent you can be a partner of a country like America? If you look at Afghanistan, for example, if America, if Afghanistan is being left behind and abandoned, then can a country like India rely on America? Those questions are all valid. But I'm looking at today from the point of view of India uh, and certain trend lines that are developing, and this is one important trend line that I think <clears throat> is important to observe over a period of time uh, as to what its actual consequences would be. One of the consequences, of course, we have seen that India has moved considerably forward in, in its engagement with the US in signing foundational agreements and building defense partnerships to an extent that was impossible to imagine just five years back or even a decade back uh, and, and so on and so forth in part participating in Quad. Let's also remember in 2007, India and Australia were the reasons that Quad uh, did not get off the ground. By 2017, it, it was getting off the ground. 2021, this year, we have seen leader service summit the Quad. Again, it would not have been possible if India were dragging its feet. So, so there is a change happening here in terms of the idea about India's role in the world. And this is one important element of that change. A few, few other important elements that we have seen focus shifting away 
to a certain extent uh, from this obsession with Pakistan to uh, to an obsession with uh, I would say uh, good good obsession with China because at, 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 at some fundamental level uh, you know that is the big big story of our times and how India relates to China how India manages China how India deals with China is going to be one of the most uh, important developments of, for Indian foreign policy. So we have seen that shift happening both operationally, ideationally, as well as tactically, you know, whether building infrastructure, whether it is uh, tailoring your armed forces, or whether it is thinking about economics. And there, I think, some interesting conversation we can have later on about what it means by you know, uh, India is still importing a huge amount, but India is putting restrictions on Chinese investment in critical sectors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, then, of course, uh, this whole notion of Pakistan obsession, not focusing on, on East Western Front, but focusing on the Eastern Front of India's neighborhood, where India uh, becomes part of the Bay of Bengal narrative, that rather than focusing on the Arabian Sea or on, on, on Pakistan frontier, on Pakistan too much, let's focus on those partners in the neighborhood, uh, which are willing to give India benefit of the doubt, which are willing to engage with India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Everywhere, there is a larger trend of China imposing its will. There is a larger trend of China becoming very, very important. But India focusing more on the Bay of Bengal, more on neighbors like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, and Thailand and Myanmar, which give India a claim to having organic links with Southeast Asia. So India's activist policy, a derivative of India's Dukis policy today, is premised on this argument that India is not an outsider to Southeast Asia. That in, it's not that India has to be invited to Southeast Asian uh, gatherings. India is organically linked. If you look at our Northeast, it's linked to uh, Myanmar. So if, if that is the if it, that is the geography, if you look at India's historical ties, maritime ties, trade ties, cultural ties with, with countries like Myanmar and Thailand, they give you an organic link to Southeast Asia, and therefore they give you a different context to your engagement with Southeast Asia and East Asia, and therefore your role in the Pacific around China's periphery can be articulated differently. And finally, on global governance, uh, as I was saying earlier, there is, a, there, is, uh, there is a greater push on global governance, and there is a greater desire to play a larger role, whether it's climate change, institutional reforms, and global health. Uh, a lot Indian government got a lot of criticism on, uh, on vaccine diplomacy, but I, but I would say that uh, I think, I mean, personally, I thought that um, it was important to do. Uh, in the first, uh, wave of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, when India was relatively well off, uh, and not to have used your own pharmaceutical um, advantages for the betterment of the wider world um, uh, would have looked quite um, uh, feeble, I think, from India's point of view. So India did well by, by, uh, used, by helping other countries uh, in the first, first wave. Obviously, second wave has different set of connotations and it can be different set of consequences. Uh, so I, you know, in, in, that, in that sense, there are a number of issues on global governance where India is willing to push uh, on and, and, and taking on a role that in the past India has been relatively reluctant to take. Uh, so I would just end by saying that all that is happening in a context where, as Rafiq pointed out uh, in his uh, initial um, slides, that one fundamental problem remains, and this is the problem, that is the capacity problem. So capacity in all, you know, whether it is economic capacity, whether it is uh, military capacity, whether it is institutional capacity, all of those, the capacity issue remains where it is, and we have progressed, but that capacity issue continues to hinder uh, India's ambitions to a certain extent that is, uh, you know, that often uh, you have for, for, a, for, a, for a strategy to work, your ends and ways and means have to be in balance. And I think uh, a lot of the problems that India has are domestic in nature. They are about reviving India's domestic building, domestic muscle of India, building domestic capabilities and capacities of India. And unless that is done, uh, I think a lot of these questions about India's global rise uh, will not be able to materialize. And a lot of these questions will not be answered because a lot of the obstacles will remain at the level of domestic, uh, uh, the ability of India to resolve these problems domestically. Uh, but those uh, I can take later on. Uh, I think I will end there and uh, give the floor to uh, Roma for uh, comments and observations and her uh, questions.
Thank you, sir. Yes, Dr. Parama, over to you. And uh, also for the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to write on the chat box. Yes, Dr. Parama, over to you. Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, no, no, you need to unmute. Bottom left hand side, if you see there's a symbol which says mute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Simi, thank you, Arjun, for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Uh, uh, let me uh, begin by saying that thank you, uh, uh, Harsh, for this uh, wonderful, insightful paper. Uh, I will raise questions uh, subsequently, but uh, uh, before that, let me flag a few issues that I want to discuss. Uh, the world order, like we all know, has fundamentally order, uh, altered. Politics has become much more fragmented and volatile. Nationalism has become a stronger political force while protectionist sentiment has predominantly increased. Domestic issues have, have become much more important and are consuming global leaderships. Global freedom and liberal democracies are under siege across the world. So in this kind of a growing uncertainty, COVID-19 is threatening human race. So this is the background. This is how, you know, this is what we are witnessing right now. So now let me, uh, uh, you know, let me flag a few issues. I completely agree with uh, Harsh when he talks about, uh, you know, India playing a larger role, India wanting to play a more responsible role. And in this, I want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, talk about the quad. I thought I should uh, uh, talk about, uh, mention uh, a few things about India when it comes to they are playing a more responsible and a major power role. Uh, New Delhi, like uh, Harsh has just mentioned, it was quite skeptical of reviving Quad. But now it has emerged a driver of recent progress as it confronts an escalating tension with China. In fact, in a sharp contrast to the past, Indian officials. Yeah. Uh, Indian officials are now much more vocal champions of the Quad and its conceptual cousin, the Indo-Pacific that once again Hirsch has mentioned. I would like to mention here India's move to create an Indo-Pacific division, which is quite significant as it bureaucratically aligns the Ministry of External Affairs with the Prime Minister's vision of the Indo-Pacific as spanning from the shores of Africa to the Americas, making the desk central mode to coordinate activities across the various regional desks. In fact, it is very interesting to see how China has started to perceive the Quad. It had said, you know, it has actually changed from the sea form in Pacific or the Indian Ocean to how the Quad now is representing one of the most consequential challenges to Chinese ambitions in the years ahead. It actually signals how strategic circumstances change and new challenges emerge in the world order. Uh, in fact, in another move, India even invited Australia to participate in the Mal Malabar Naval Exercise. It is again notable because India had previously refused to allow Australia, fearing it would antagonize China. However, the border clashes with China, the latest one last year in May, when India and the Chinese troops had face-offs and skirmishes at locations across the Sino-Indian border and near the border between Sikkim and the Tibetan Autonomous Region has been responsible for ending the hesitation. So, uh, while this is one of the things that I wanted to you know, highlight, uh, let me now come to a few questions that I want to raise. Uh, 
you know, one is rising powers want more space at the global high table. And in fact, since World War II, international institutions have not really reformed themselves to accommodate other players. It continues to be still their monopoly. I, this is one of the questions that I want, would like to raise. How do you think this can be managed by countries like India, the middle powers, like Australia? How do you think this is going to change? Do you think it is uh, this, the whole structure, the international, the in, uh, these international institutions can be reformed? Because this has been one of the crime needs of the time. Harsh also talks about economic globalization, undergoing transformation. How is it going to face? How do you think it's going to, uh, you know, a challenge that India is going to face? Uh, apart from this, uh, I also wanted to uh, ask, uh, as we all know that the pandemic is raging across borders, people are speculating the future of geopolitical implications that it is causing. Do you think it will reset US-China relations? If yes, how? Uh, I also would want uh, Hush, if he, uh, if he can, uh, talk about a little about the middle powers. The middle plow powers like Australia, Canada, UK, India, of course, a group of large economies with active democracies who have come together primarily because of their discomfort with China in some way or the other. While being a heterogeneous group of countries, they also share common concerns like climate change, public health, natural disasters, and COVID. Do you think this group will play a more active role in global politics than before? And lastly, I think with Afghanistan falling to the Taliban, how do you think it's going to shape South Asia and the world at large? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paloma, for raising very important uh, issues. So, um, Professor Pan, would you like to respond? And uh, Professor uh, Rafiq Dusani, if you have further questions to add. Uh, no, go ahead, Harsh, and then I'll add questions. Yes, yes. Oh, I thought Rafiq would answer all of them. <laughs> You're on a roll. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Parama. I think um, you know, they, they're all uh, questions which I think flow from what um, I think all three of us have pointed out. In some ways, the architecture changing and, uh, and the, the fundamentals of the global economy shifting, uh, the questions that are being asked about uh, uh, strategic autonomy, because a lot of the times, uh, the question about strategic autonomy is also. Uh, filtered through institutions and filtered through. Well, now we are looking at it through partnerships in India. Uh, I think we, we can go back to Indian history and think of how Indian uh, policymakers uh, at one point in time were looking at global institutions with a certain um, uh, veneration uh, and they used to use those institutions not only to project a sense of Indian leadership uh, but also to push for Indian interests. So I think uh, you know, at different vantage points, uh, some of these issues have, have uh, come together. But you know, when when you talk about Parama was talking of international institutions and how uh, certainly they you know, they have um, they have not been able to respond in some way, but they have not they have not evolved. I think they have not kept pace with the larger uh, realities of the, of, of the power and you know, shift in economics. Uh, and shift in, uh, in, therefore, in large political fundamentals. Now, I am. Uh, I, I don't know to what extent some of these organizations can be reformed. We have, you know, we can. We have been talking about UNSC reforms now for ages. Uh, you know, we know there are so many commissions have been set up, and so many commissions have recommended so many things. Uh, but we have not, you know, UN reforms. Uh, whatever reforms have happened, they have happened at the bureaucratic level. The fundamental reforms that are needed in power structure. The, fund, uh, you know, in the decision making process and in particular the UN Security Council, they look uh, as difficult as ever. And I think now that we are entering into a, into a phase of greater political fragmentation and polarization, uh, UNSC, uh, we are already looking at a UN Security Council that is very fragmented, that is very divided, uh, 
China and Russia have used more vetoes in the last few uh, in the last few years than they have used over the past several decades. So I think we are looking at uh, you know at an, again a situation where uh, power uh, transition is going is, is imposing costs on these institutions and their ability to sustain the present global order. So I'm I'm personally not very uh, you know, hopeful that the extent uh, institutions can be reformed given the power and disparity the power rivalry that is going on. Where I think we are moving to, it seems to me, at least if you look at what is happening in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific, what is happening is something very interesting, which is, which is that we are seeing this emergence of various geometries. Quad is one geometry, but various trilaterals are there, various uh, other engagements are happening. Uh, Thoma talked about middle powers. You see a lot of middle powers interacting amongst themselves. Uh, you have Japan, Australia, India, uh, you have Australia, Japan, South Korea, you have uh, you know, US uh, also be part of se se several trilaterals. You have India, Indonesia, Australia trilateral. Uh, you have, of course, there is Quad. Uh, and, and I think at the end of the day, uh, given the costs that, that uh, uh, and given the constraints that are, uh, you know, that, uh, that perhaps make uh, a, a reform or even uh, uh, you know, a, a, a broader of the possibility of imagining a new organization uh, difficult. Those constraints, I think, are making nations go down a different route. In the short term, I think we are going to see more of these, these kind of trend lines where these you know, uh, coalitions of the winning are likely to emerge. And these coalitions uh, will have like-minded countries. For example, you know, even on Afghanistan question, something very interesting is happening. If you see the responses of major powers, you, you can easily see two blocks. You have Russia, China, Pakistan, and Turkey on one side, and you have countries like Britain who are talking of the West taking uh, a stand on Afghanistan uh, together with like-minded countries. Similarly, you, you go back to uh, emerging technology debate, you go to, back to the debate on 5G. There also you see this, this trend line that, countries saying we will develop technology with like-minded countries. We will work with like-minded countries to develop 5G, for example. And then, uh, of course, uh, UK had proposed this uh, uh, group of democracies who can work together on, uh, on 5G technology. So I think my, you know, my, my own sense is that countries are going to veer towards these kind of uh, groupings rather than uh, investing a lot in institutions, in formal institutions, because as we all know, formal institutions take time, formal institutions require a lot of investment, and formal institutions also require a certain kind of a power structure that allows those powers to then mediate these conflicts and, and bring to bear those institutions. So given where we are, I, I, I see that very difficult uh, possibility. But economic globalization, certainly, I think economic globalization is, is, is something that is going to impact all of us, and it's already impacting a lot. All of us, I think, Paroma talked about this the sense of nationalism that we are witnessing today. Economic nationalism, very serious uh, consequences. But this is a, this is also a reflection of the way uh, the forces of globalization is, have operated, uh, and the unequal distribution of wealth that has happened, greater disparities. I think all those questions uh, are being looked at uh, and are being engaged with by the policymakers in different countries in different ways. But by and large, the template is the same that all the nations, uh, the, you know, the people in most of the countries, especially in democracies, are putting a lot of pressure on policymakers uh, on, on these questions. I remember uh, uh, Indian Prime Minister, for example, saying, and he said this after, after COVID-19, uh, the first when it struck India, he said that one of the most important lessons India has learned is, uh, is that uh, India needs to be self-reliant uh, in critical sectors. And I think he was referring to the fact that uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry in India was overly reliant on, um, on uh, imports from China. And, uh, and I think at that particular point in time, given that the rest of the world needed um, uh, you know, Indian help, uh, there, there was this concern whether, whether we would face problems from China. So I think you know, those sorts of questions where, which have led to this idea of uh, self-reliant India campaign that India is, India is running at the moment. Uh, that is one reflection of that. How successful that is going to be, I, I don't think you know, very much. But certainly that is, a, you know, that is something that 
uh, countries like India and countries, uh, even other countries. Uh, and let us also remember that the uh, US has been at the forefront of this, uh, saying that first things you would need. Uh, one of the interesting um, comments from Biden administration has been that uh, our foreign policy, uh, every aspect of our foreign policy should reflect uh, the needs and aspirations of American middle classes. So in, in a sense, uh, there is a recognition that American middle classes perhaps are not happy uh, and uh, they are not getting the benefits of, uh, of uh, global engagement and they should be catered to. So I think we are looking at this, uh, this very interesting phenomena where economic globalization will be impacting a lot of the aspects. But finally, I think on Afghanistan, I'm, uh, this is a great question, but I think that given the rapidity of change in Afghanistan, it's very difficult to um, make any assessment at this point. The only assessment you can make is that I think um, it's going to be a difficult ride for ordinary Afghans uh, for a while, because a lot of them, um, you know, who, especially those who invested a lot on, on this idea, you know, the, the, the liberal ideas that uh, freedom and democracy and human rights would be sustained by the international community perhaps would be finding themselves abandoned today in more ways than one. So how uh, also the costs of this are, will be borne by them more than anyone else. Uh, you know, America can move on, uh, NATO can move on, uh, and uh, Taliban will be there for a while at least. Uh, but uh, I think uh, for all three of Khan's who, who, had, who were looking, uh, who, who were hoping for a different future, I think that's a, that's a challenge for them. Uh, but. I think geopolitically, this certainly, as I was mentioning earlier, it raises up questions about uh, you know, this, this whole China, US, sorry, China, Pakistan, Russia, um, you know, Turkey access, uh, and India perhaps being marginalized uh, you know, for, the, for the moment. Uh, so, what, what are India's options engaging with what countries? Uh, how to deal with Taliban if, if it's recognized by the world? I think those questions will be very significant for Indian policymakers, apart from the fact that uh, there will be some, some kind of concern uh, for the possibility of uh, the Taliban coming back to power, uh, giving a boost to certain uh, extremist groups. And this is not India specific, this is across the region, uh, including uh, countries like Pakistan and China will find it very difficult to deal with. With, with some of the groups who will, who will think, who will view, but who are viewing this as a great victory uh, of extremism, extremist forces against uh, America, uh, against a mighty military power. Uh, so I think those questions remain an answer, um, but uh, certainly the regional flux, South Asian region is, is in for a ride for at least a few years at the present time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess my question is uh, you know, to measure impact. You know, India wants to be a regional and a global participant with influence. Um, so if one looks at China, for example, over the last decade, you can see its footprint enlarging you know, in terms of impact. The Belt and Road Initiative, for example, is a big uh, has already had a massive impact on the economies of the country. Some, you know, there's all this talk of, of debt traps and so on. But that's really doesn't hold up under serious analysis. So, you know, you have that. You have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You have the Forum on Africa China Cooperation. You see, uh, and a lot of money, um, healthcare, digital services, uh, flow through these. Uh, organizations, in the case of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you see a lot of political and uh, military benefits to China and Russia, of course. My question to you is, uh, and to both of you is, where, where do you see the opportunity for India to have impact? Does it require India to develop and propose new institutions and initiatives? Or can it work within existing ones? If so, what is the evidence of impact? Thank you. Okay. You're on mute. Sure, sure. I go first. Uh, do you want to go first with the response? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, 
India is definitely projecting itself as a responsible power, as a major player in world politics. In fact, one of the examples could be, uh, you know, with respect to India's climate change mitigation. Uh, India has uh, initiated the solar international solar uh, alliance uh, with countries. So here you can see that India is actually trying to lead. Uh, with respect to whether it should, uh, you know, whether uh, it can uh, play a, a more important role or a leading role in other institutions, international institutions, uh, I think that really depends. Because, but again, uh, like right now, uh, as a member of the Uni United Nations Security Council, it is playing a big role, and uh, I. I, I think uh, it. Uh, I, I think India is uh, that way, is trying its best to uh, show its uh, its uh, uh, you know its power. Uh, it is trying to be accommodating. It is trying to signal that uh, it is like uh, Harsh just said that it's going to be. It's not going to be a uh, just a taker and observer, but wants to play a more active role in global politics. Rafik, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, there, is a, there is a resource divergence between China and India, I mean, that can't be denied. So what are the options? I think that's essentially what the question that you are raising. What can India do to, uh, to see that, you know, that that resource constraint, uh, constraint does not really become uh, the fundamental factor uh, that puts India back? What, 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 what are some of the creative ways of thinking about Whatever you have, what do you do with it? I think one of the ways uh, in which um, India has tried to differentiate itself is to say that, look, uh, Ch you know, China is a big player. China is a big country. We cannot do what, things like what China does. But we have, we have a slightly different approach to some of these questions. For example, development aid or, or, or financing infrastructure. India does not do it bilaterally at the scale that China does. But wherever it does, I think if you, if you see the African model, uh, China, of course, is, is, is much bigger, but I think if you look at, the, at India's model that is more about, uh, uh, you know, bottom up and participatory and more about, uh, uh, you know, looking at it from the vantage point of the participant country. Uh, so uh, there are issues around uh, India's approach to development aid and how it projects that development aid, whatever uh, development aid it gives, uh, and that aid has risen in comparison to what it was in the past, and it is more targeted. I think one of the questions has always, uh, which India has always struggled with is, uh, is um, you know, is uh, operationalizing uh, the aid. You, you can declare that, you know, that this is going to be a big partnership, but actually what is happening on the ground uh, has been very, very limited. India, India uh, struggles when it comes to implementing projects, delivering projects. And that has been a big, big problem, both in India's immediate neighborhood, as well as in, in countries in, uh, in Africa, for example. So I think one of the ways in which there has been some movement in the direction is that now we do see a more um, streamlined and time-bound approach to uh, completing projects, uh, to, uh, to development aid, where it is going, how it is being spent, and whether we have something to show for that in the end. So I think that has been that has been a shift in, in the way it operationalizes uh, some of these ideas. The other, I think, has been that uh, uh, compared to what what used to happen in the past, uh, India is much more active in, in you know making that projection that, uh, for example, Parama mentioned International Solar Alliance. Now, uh, if you go back to the Indian debates with the West on climate change, uh, and uh, just a decade back, you can see the transformation. It was always about that you know, we are not responsible, West is responsible, why should we care? To a, to a point where India is now saying, well, we are willing to invest in this, we are willing to move forward with this, and we are even willing to create new institutional frameworks like International Solar Alliance. Uh, and there is also another one, uh, climate change disaster, uh, disaster, I think climate, disaster resilience uh, infrastructure, CDRI, where uh, the idea is that if, if India's neighbors are suffering from uh, climate-induced disasters, then disaster management can be done by uh, India with the help of the other like partners. So I think uh, you know, there are initiatives that India is taking. They're, they're smaller. You know, they can't be compared to DRI. Uh, but I think that is something that India feels it can do to scale that up 
and, and I think that's where uh, some of the some of the changes in the present global order will impinge on India's foreign policy because there is a growing contestation now between the West and China. A uh, lot of the countries uh, earlier on that were not interested in in doing stuff with India are suddenly you know suddenly this model of collaboration like India America India European Union working in Africa together or India Japan talking of uh, Asia Africa growth corridor uh, where it has not uh, you know done uh, as well as perhaps it should have should have had. But the idea that India and Japan can work together, they are working together in, uh, in uh, South Asia, so, you know, countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have several projects where India and China work together. Similarly, uh, the idea of uh, in Africa, uh, you know, that, that where India's traditional advantages plus uh, Europe's and Japan's technical advancement together can collaborate and bring advance, uh, bring help and give help to African nations. That's the model which I think India is using to scale up some of its um, ambitions around the world. Again, how far it will succeed, I don't know. I mean, it's very early to say, but uh, you know, it, it, this is a slightly different approach to the Chinese question, which is, I think China is the kind of resources, the kind of breadth uh, that China has. China can do it all on its own. But when it also, I think what, what is interesting is this, this challenging China or challenging, uh, not saying it as much, but challenging it. Uh, you know, when uh, Paloma mentioned UN Security Council presidency. Now, this is the first time that you have the presidency where Prime Minister sat and chaired a meeting on maritime security. There was no obvious reason to do that apart from the fact that India wanted to show that this is a very important uh, aspect of our foreign policy. And uh, the points that, that the Prime Minister mentioned included, you know, he talked of some nice things like marine, marine ecology and how um, maritime security, maritime trade is dependent on everyone else. But he also took pot shots at China. He also made it very clear that, look, this is also about uh, um, uh, countries should also resolve their maritime disputes based on international law. Uh, and maritime infrastructure should also uh, not be built uh, without taking the participant country into account, its, its ability to sustain it financially and environmentally. So I think the, the message was very clear. So I think that is also a big shift happening on global platforms, India is willing to take that kind of a leadership where it is willing to be more explicit about which direction it wants to go and how it wants to shape the narrative. So, you know, those are some of the ways in which one can look at it. And I, and I would also add, by the way, on BRI, BRI is, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot that, uh, you know, that, uh, that has been written about BRI and it's a, it's a huge uh, project in any case. But India, when it, when it started from the very beginning, India opposed BRI. India was the only country that opposed major power uh, that opposed BRI from the very beginning. At that point in time, India was alone. Uh, and I think since then, uh, and the points that India raised uh, about, they were not simply about the fact that BRI was, that we had a CPEG that was passing through uh, you know, China, uh, to what India considers disputed territory. Uh, but India is also other points like financial sustainability, environmental sustainability, uh, participation of local population, whether it is being decided in Beijing or whether, whether this is something that is about, about capacity building of the countries in question. And I think today, if you look at the Western response to BRI, it may be strategic, uh, but it is largely derivative of Indian original response. And I think in, in that sense, also, if you look at India's role as a norm shaper or as a discourse shaper, I think that is also something that is uh, that India is trying to do. So I think at multiple levels, uh, you see that engagement, whether that footprint, whether that uh, engagement translates into something which is uh, more tangible over a period of time, uh, that of course remains to be seen. Can I also add something here, please? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, in fact, uh, I also want to add here that India's uh, India has a lot of goodwill. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please continue. Yeah. So India also has a lot of goodwill. When you compare China and India, I think India's uh, uh, you know India's democratic credentials, as opposed to China's authoritarianism, authoritarian tendencies, that also plays a role. When you talk about aid. You know, uh, with respect to uh, China, they are all talking about the debt trap. 
But with respect to India, the kind of reputation that India has, I think that goes a long way in uh, getting the kind of goodwill that India has internationally as opposed to China. Thanks. Sure, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Dusani, would, would it be fine that we take a few questions from the audience? Rafiksa, please unmute. Yes, Simi, go ahead. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, so it has been really uh, enriching this time. No issues, sir. Sir, do you want to add anything? No, no, please. Okay, ahead. okay, okay. So there are a few uh, questions about uh, Professor Pant. Uh, would you, you know, you spoke about the global governance and uh, structural changes in your uh, in your presentation. So there's a question about uh, India being the weak link in the institutional setup of Quad, and also if we talk about uh, institutions, um, you mentioned that uh, SARC is defunct, and would would. Um, BBIN be a response to uh, this transition that is going on in the institutional domain, um, and also can it can India take the lead in solidifying this kind of a, a sub-regional structure? And what kind of uh, multi-sectoral uh, cooperation can be seen? Uh, if you can take that question, and uh, I can also put up one more question from the audience: Is that uh, about? Uh, um, you know, you, you mentioned that unofficially we are heading towards an Asian order where China, Russia, and India will play a greater role in order to negotiate with China. We need a strong American presence in Asian geopolitics. Hence, given the situation, what would be India's geopolitical strategy to deal with rising China and Russia having indirect support to a declining or weakening or even, you know, inwardly, the inward orientation of America that you mentioned? This question is by Saddam Hussein. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, they're all great questions. And I, um, and I think uh, I, mean, I, I will take them one by one. The, the, the weak link uh, in court, I don't, you know, I frankly, I don't agree with that. Uh, see, every country, every every member of the Quad was a weak link when it started. You know, Japan articulated, Shinzo Abe in, uh, in 2006 articulated this idea of conference of the two seas. But how far Japan was willing to go uh, was not, you know, it remains an open question even today. Because Japan has a very vibrant economic relations uh, relationship with China. It is an uh, alliance, uh, you know, and, and also let's not forget that US, uh, uh, Japan, and Australia, all three of them are alliance partners. US, uh, Japan, and Australia are alliance partners of, of the US. They're treaty, you know, they're treaty bound. America is treaty bound to protect them. India is not an alliance partner. So India is trying to do something new. India is trying to engage on a platform of this magnitude without actually signing a treaty with, with the US. So I think people often underestimate how much, <laughs> how much resolve that takes. You know, you, you know in India, uh, it's very difficult to make a case for an alliance. Alliance is a bad word in Indian political dictionary. You don't want alliance partners. So to take India to a stage where India is saying, look, our, our politics means that we can't sign a treaty with you as an alliance partner. Short of that, we are willing to work with you on common mutual interests. And that is a, you know, that is a leap of faith for and both for India and for other countries, especially for the US. Because US is also not used to dealing with these nebulous countries that are neither here nor there. So I think it, it, it has required a lot of work uh, since, uh, 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 since the end of the Cold War, where India and the US started working towards each other, working gradually towards each other. 1998 happened, then nuclear deal happened, uh, a civilian nuclear deal with the US. And eventually, today, US and India are looking at the region through a similar strategic prism. 
and that you know, but that also does not mean that uh, India and the US will become an alliance partners tomorrow. No. So you have to figure out a response within those constraints. And I think India's response, therefore, is that yes, we are willing to go with the Quad. We are willing to engage with, with the Quad today. Uh, and, and again, you can go back to 2007 when it was not India that, uh, it was not only India that went back on Quad. It was also Australia. Kevin Rudd. And, and you know, if you read Mr. Rudd today, he's writing op-eds on how um, you know how malignant China has become, and this is the this is the same Kevin Rudd in two thousand seven who was just you know, genuflecting um, you know, in front of China, who was just saying wonderful how great China is, how how uh, China has changed the world, and how China is going to transform the world. We have to in integrate more with China, perhaps for right reasons then, and perhaps it's good that he has changed his views now. But let's you know. Uh, you know, it's not that India is the weakest link in import. India has, has, has had a certain position. But all countries have been struggling with this question, right? You cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, you know, managing China is a very difficult task at a time when you're, you're economically tied with China. At the same time, you want a strategic autonomy from China. But that is not, today the consensus is that that's not possible. And therefore, you see all kinds of uh, attempts to uh, move away from China. You know, there's a Japan, Australia, India um, uh, supply chain resilience initiative. What is it about? That, that, that supply chain resilience initiative is about reducing dependence on China because the structure of global supply chains is such that where China sits at the center. And Australia and Japan and India want uh, re to reduce their dependence on it. So I think we are looking at, uh, you know, at a world that is evolving in a certain direction. And India, with all its challenges, is now beginning to take up, uh, make up its mind about where it wants to go. Some of these uh, will be uh, difficult, some decisions, but decisions, I think, they are gradually happening. So I, I would not say that India is the weakest thing. Uh, all the countries have had their own challenges with China. Even America was not willing to say everything. Let's not forget that even uh, when Obama came to office, uh, we were talking, there were members of Obama's cabinet uh, who were talking about G2. Of a possibility of a G2. So America and China and Australia and China and uh, Japan and China and India and China have different dynamics. And they are dealing with, the, with the, you know, India is dealing with them uh, as, as, as are other countries. I would not say that India is an interesting uh, in the institutional architecture of God. In fact, now India is the strongest thing because India is the most potent actor there. India has stood up to China. Which other country has stood up to China uh, militarily and pushed China back? Japan has not done it. Australia has not done it. Only Americans, Americans keep uh, coming up with their uh, fleet of uh, naval ships here in, in the Pacific Ocean as a show of strength. But India, despite being knowing that India is a weaker country, India stood up to China uh, along the border, both uh, at Oklahoma crisis uh, and Galwan crisis. So, uh, you know, let us not over, uh, uh, you know, while not overplaying India card, and I think that's also not underestimate what India brings to the table. Uh, I, uh, in terms of EBIN and uh, and uh, SARC, I, I, I think there I agree. Uh, Bay of Bengal is the focus. Bay of Bengal should be the focus because nothing is happening on the SARC front. But that does not mean that India should give up on, on regional leadership. There are many countries in the region that want India to, uh, you know, to, to have much better response to their problems. Uh, and uh, India should be responding to them. I think if you look at uh, Bangladesh, for example, uh, Sheikh Hasina government was very positive about India. Now, uh, they have, and they have been able to get a lot from India in terms of bilateral relations, economic relations. A lot of the disputes have been resolved. So I think uh, we are looking at the Bay of Bengal as, as a new, very productive sub-region grouping in, in South Asia, which, was, uh, which where India should be focusing more. I wish India were focusing even more. I don't think India is doing enough. Uh, there is a lot of talk of BIMSTEC, but nothing much is happening on the ground. I think India should be doing much more on BIMSTEC uh, but BBIN, of course, is uh, you know um, um, where uh, where things are moving in the right direction. It's uh, but still, I think it can go faster. Uh, rising China, you know, uh, and what what can India do? Uh, see that the conundrum that India faces is very simple. Uh, you know, foreign policy is not it's not a one way street. If you you know you often hear this argument that. India should be willing to enter, India should be engaging China more. Uh, 
and uh, not relying on America more because America is a declining power. Now, it's all right. I mean, India has been trying to engage with China for the last seven decades, at least since 1960s, right? So it's not as if, uh, you know, it's, it's a one-way street where India can try all it wants. It's also what China wants out of India. Does China want to engage India? I'm not so sure. Because uh, most of the, uh, after Galwan Valley incident, whatever little we have heard is, is China not actually recognizing how fundamentally it has hurt China-Indian relations. If China is not understanding this, this, this reality as far as India is concerned, then there is, I think, very, it's very difficult for Sino-Indian relations to move forward. And therefore, India will have to find alternatives. And while America might be declining or may be declining, um, America is an important partner, becomes an important partner. So I don't see this as a, as a problem uh, because you have to find solutions uh, amongst the bouquet of solutions that are available to you. And, uh, I, you know, uh, America, whether declining or not, whether rising or not, remains a potent global player. And India will have to, uh, you know, engage America more. And that is, and that has been the trajectory of uh, India, uh, India-America relations over the last uh, three decades at least. That despite different governments in New Delhi, despite different administrations in Washington, we have seen a consistent effort on the part of New Delhi and Washington to develop a robust relationship. That is not simply based on China factor. China is an important factor, but not simply on China factor. But today, the situation, the global environment, and the global order means that both uh, America and India have to engage with, with, with each other much more substantially. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So there are a few questions further, uh, but uh, I would now invite uh, Dr. Rafiq Dosani for, uh, to respond to. There are two questions for you, sir. Um, with Pakistan, Taliban, and Afghanistan, Iran, do you see these countries as colonies of, in, of China? This may further be a problem for India. Perhaps the, it is an implicit Chinese strategy. And another question is, uh, what's happening with the blue dot strategy? Uh, this bureaucratic response to BRI has taken a backseat in the Biden administration. Sir, uh, please unmute. Yes, thank you. Good questions. So on the first one about um, China's ability to control Pakistan uh, and through Pakistan to control Afghanistan and the roles of the Afghan Taliban and Pakistan Taliban in this, um, obviously, these are early days and we don't know what's going to happen. But I would think that the amount that um, Pakistan has uh, paid a price of since 2001 for being a frontline state in the fight against terror, it's about 70,000 lives lost according to their own calculation, which far exceeds that of any other frontline state, uh, untold economic costs on them. You know, the fact is it's become a weak, failing uh, fragile economy as a, partly as a result of that. So I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping there's uh, rationality on the part of the Pakistan leadership to, to accept that. And it seems from when you hear Prime Minister Imran Khan, he seems quite sens sensible in his uh, approach, that there is an understanding of what uh, the Taliban is about. And he, he may give them some space you know, people often talk about the strategic depth that China, Pakistan gets from controlling Afghanistan. Uh, that's, it sounds odd to me that you'd claim strategic depth from a country that's so much weaker than your own and even more volatile. To the, on the other hand, I think Afghanistan got strategic depth, the Taliban in particular from Pakistan, as they fought over the last 20 years. Um, so, you know, I think it's early days, but I think, uh, you know, one can hope that there will be um, uh, better outcomes ahead. Uh, sorry, what was the second question, Simi? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, it is about the blue dot strategy, sir. Uh, Has yeah, it taken yeah. a back seat now? Mm. Yes, it seems to have. Um, it's the blue dot refers to the interest of the United States and other countries to create um, a standards-based framework for infrastructure investment. I mean, logically, it was always a non-starter. Uh, if you know, most of the infrastructure being put in today by overseas investment is from China, the new one anyway. Uh, for the US to get involved in this would be to, in effect, subsidize China's standards. Because you know, if the railroad is built by China, what are you going to do about setting the standards for that? 
and it's a low cost uh, approach that uh, that the US favored. Uh, but you know, it didn't make logical sense since the US wasn't going to put in the money for the infrastructure itself. See, that's what's happened. You know, you have China now with the money. The US should have the money, but needs it at home. And so that's, I think, where I think Harsh has also pointed this out is this big asymmetry. You need other players with the money who can come in with great ideas and implement things. You know, we, I asked, that's why I asked the question about impact. You know, a lot of the, the answers were, you still, we don't know the impact, you know, Quad, what is the impact? Uh, the Solar Sol Alliance, what is the impact? So I think spending some, some time thinking back, recalibrating, taking a back seat for a while, no harm done, in my opinion. Of course, events might prove otherwise, but so that's what I feel. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Pant, uh, this is a question by uh, Dhiman Sarkar, who is asking how is India addressing the issue of data localization in this new era of increasingly interconnected global order, understanding the importance of access to big data? Uh, yes, I think, uh, you know, we are still to a certain extent uh, unclear uh, about, about what, what uh, this might uh, impact, because this is an issue uh, which, which impacts uh, both uh, the domestic debate at this point about uh, data in India, about big tech in India, and also it's uh, India's engagement with the wider world, especially its partners, where uh, there is a degree of uh, conflict, where India does not see eye to eye. Um, you know, with its partners in the West in particular. So I think the question at, the, at this point is, and this is, this is particularly important uh, because this is an area where new regimes, new norms, new standards are being set. So India wants to be there, India wants to be uh, part of this, uh, this larger discourse, but there is conflict between what is happening domestically and how it wants to respond, uh, you know, to this, this whole notion of um, big tech uh, and how they approach the world. We have seen, for example, recent debates in India about Twitter and about um, Facebook. Uh, so there is a lot that is happening in terms of uh, big tech and their ability uh, and, and, and their role in, in, in India domestically, uh, which at times often makes it difficult for India to coordinate response uh, with its partners elsewhere. Uh, so my own sense is that you know, it will be a while before this is settled because uh, this is, uh, as they say, this is a two-level game being played. Yeah. And unless the two levels are leveled out, uh, the final outcome will not be the same. Sure. Thank you so much for your responses. So now we move towards the concluding part. And I would just um, re request uh, both Professor Pant and uh, followed by Dr. Rafiq Dosani to uh, provide your perspectives on the way forward as in India's role in the evolving situation uh, in the world order. And also perhaps maybe think about or talk about a little bit on policy challenges uh, that are there for India's foreign policy. And also, if are we ready to uh, counter any blitzkrieg in the hotspots of the world, especially where India's security interests are at stake? So I would request uh, Professor Pant to go first. Uh, yes, yeah, I think um, uh, one of the problems today is uh, that I think all countries are facing is, uh, you know, the, the, the scale and scope of change is much faster. So you are constantly responding and you're responding in real time often to uh, things uh, that uh, your institutions perhaps are not able uh, to handle. And that, uh, that leads to lots of challenges at a number of levels, because at times you're responding just because it is happening now. So, we, so there's no strategic thinking behind it. It's all about here and now you have to respond in real time. You're, you're giving a response, but that, that, might, be a, that might end up harming your long-term interests. Uh, and, uh, but not acting also becomes, becomes problematic. That, that, that's also becomes a challenge in and of itself. If you just look at Afghanistan, how fast things have evolved in the last uh, you know, uh, few days, it's, it's incredible. I mean, 
in India, the debate was, uh, if, you, if you're reading op-eds, it was largely about whether to engage Taliban or not to engage Taliban, but suddenly you know that Taliban is the only entity in town. So I think the, the question, therefore, is that, uh, you know, the ability of states uh, to respond to some of these challenges uh, is, also, is also a problem. And I, our, I would say our biggest challenge is institutional. Uh, there have been, you know, in, our, we are institutionally unprepared uh, to meet a lot of these challenges. We are still struggling to craft these institutions uh, you know, in, in, in many ways. For example, uh, MEA, uh, I think Paroma was talking about the Indo-Pacific Division in the MEA. There have been several changes in the MEA, bringing in uh, outside expertise, link-ups with think tanks, engagements with, um, you know, re redrafting, recrafting of the various verticals uh, res to respond to the, to the changing global order. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, is that enough? Uh, are, we, are we doing it enough? Is the, is the synergy across governments uh, out there? For example, we, we often need a whole of, go uh, whole of government approach to some of these questions. As I was saying, on, on economic issues also, if you go, uh, when you, you're talking of national security, India decided to, uh, uh, to not sign the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement because it decided that RCEP uh, will lead to certain challenges in certain aspects, um, as far as Indian economy is concerned, as far as India's national security is concerned, and so on. Now, are we, do we have institutions that respond to that challenge? Uh, of, of a whole of government approach. I'm not so sure we have. I think we are getting there, we are trying to get there, but there is a lot of way to go. So I think institutional uh, capacity is a big problem. Uh, and I think uh, the, the, uh, the way Indian foreign policy is structured, is, uh, you know, it, it is often said, uh, look at India's ambitions and look at Indian foreign policy. You know, Indian foreign policy, bureaucracy is smaller than, uh, say, the bureaucracy of New Zealand or Singapore. Now, this is astonishing. India, with, 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 that wants to play such a big role, which has ambitions around the world, uh, will have to expand its, you know, first its capacity and then the quality of that capacity. I think both are important. So I think my, my own sense is that uh, uh, a lot of the times, you know, challenges will come, challenges will have to be dealt with. But how effective you are in dealing with challenges would depend on how capable your institutional fabric is. And unless that institutional fabric is strengthened, is modernized, it's constantly uh, trained and, uh, and made ready to respond to the challenge, I think you will find that um, you know, your, your response is less than sufficient, that you are not really uh, getting the best out of what you want. Uh, but on the whole, I would say that uh, there has been a movement towards greater synergy. Uh, there has been a movement towards greater uh, integration. Uh, and uh, how successful uh, that becomes remains to be seen. And how successful, as Rafiq was saying earlier, uh, in response to the different question, how successful some of these attempts of India on the global stage uh, will be, that also remains to be seen, because most of these are very, very recent initiatives. Uh, and you may, you may just find that one year from now, some of these have become redundant, or two years from now, some of these have become redundant, some initiatives have become redundant. But I would still say that not taking uh, initiatives uh, can also be a problem because there are others who are taking initiatives. So, rather, so they, are, they are willing to shape the agenda. If you are willing, to, you know, uh, if you want to shape the agenda, then I think you need to be more proactive in some ways. Uh, and uh, assess where your previous efforts have gone wrong and perhaps craft a different response. Um, but I would say that uh, there is, uh, as the flux in the global order continues, of course it presents its, set, its own set of challenges, um, but it, it also presents its own set of opportunities. And we should exploit those opportunities to the extent it can. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Over to you, Dr. Dusan. Thank you. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed this session. I thought Harsh did a fantastic job. You raised a few points, uh, Simi, um, that I'll try and address also. One is, uh, you know, it's. I think it's becoming a dangerous world out there. The Chinese are moving at a speed that uh, far exceeds anything that anyone else has yet been able to respond to. You just look at the Belt and Road Initiative 
as a daring, uh, very ingenious, uh, astonishing in terms of scale initiative. And that's just one example, there are many others. So the issue of institutional capacity that Harsh raised, I think is absolutely key for India. I mean, I've been kind of impressed with how, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we just don't have the capacity and therefore there's no impact. It's all maybes and to do's and something to look forward to. If I was just give one policy recommendation um, on what should be done, I would say focus on your neighborhood. There ought to be no way that countries like Sri Lanka, Nepal, ought to have such prickly relations with India as they do, sometimes off, sometimes on, but always an undercurrent of prickliness uh, describes those relationships. India should have figured this out a long time ago, and they should, there should have been no opportunity for China to find political capital in these uh, countries. I think focus on the region and an approach that makes sense, maybe less uh, hectoring and more aid giving, for example, might be the solution. I don't know. I think it needs a lot of thought. And finally, are there other blitzkriegs to come our way? Well, we've seen two in the last uh, two years. The pandemic was as much of a blitzkrieg as uh, the Taliban. And maybe it's just a predictor of what will come ahead. I do think the pace of change is increasing much, much more rapidly than we realize. And therefore, it becomes a particular challenge for countries like India, which are getting ready for the world stage, but are not yet ready uh, to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dusani, for this wonderful response and uh, Professor Harshpan. Uh, so we have just reached to the end of the program today. And uh, I would like to formally propose the vote of thanks. But before that, it has been really, really uh, stimulating and rich discussion have uh, just proceeded. And there is actually no singular response to the major questions that, uh, you know, questions of structural change, which Professor Pant has mentioned, and also the institutional and ideational changes that are um, happening around. So we definitely want and need a smart foreign policy, which is timely, relevant, and also, you know, uh, specific and uh, doesn't become redundant. So we have to strategi strategically craft uh, our responses. So thank you so much. It, uh, it has been really uh, a delight to listen to all of you and we have learned a lot. Um, I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies to all our panelists. Our speaker for the day, Professor Harshpan, our discussant, uh, Dr. Porama Sinha Palit, and the chair for the session, Dr. Rafiq Dosani. Uh, and all those who attended here on Zoom and also watching us live on Facebook, and also who would be watching us later on YouTube and also uh, later on uh, hearing us later on uh, podcasts. So thank you so much. And I, uh, and I wish you all a very good evening. And we look forward to hearing and learning more from you in the future. Thank you so much. We are grateful. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great session. Thank you, sir. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.